This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Welcome to the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder, and editorial director, Jamie Bogner. My guest on the podcast today is director of brewing and co-owner of Pint House Pizza in Austin, Texas, Joe Morfeld. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here before, right before GABF. Right before GABF, when uh, the kind of uh, locus and center of the brewing universe here in uh, Denver, Colorado, for this one week of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And you know, interestingly enough, you flew straight here from Yakima, Washington, where you were just out there for hop selection. Yeah, the uh, the Brewers Association, um, you know, moved uh, the Great American Beer Festival up a couple weeks this year, and um, this is kind of uh, a key week for us to go out and select hops. So, made for a, a pretty busy week. We were out in Yakima, Washington, selecting the last two days, and I was uh, I was up at three o'clock this morning after you know closing down the sports center. And uh, on a flight at five to to Seattle and then Denver, so oh, <laughs> kind of a whirlwind uh, trip, but but a lot of fun and a lot of energy out in Yakima because you know with everybody, a lot of people were leaving for JBF today after selection. Right. So tell me, let's talk a little bit about that hop selection process. Uh, you know, I talked to you, I talked to you uh, about six months ago for a cover story in our brewing industry guide, and you were uh, you you know you had some very uh, pointed and, and pitched philosophies about how you use hops in, in, in a professional brew house uh, that I thought were really interesting, but you talked about the, you know, the value of selection. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, in the integrity of those raw ingredients that you're using as being kind of an integral piece of your overall brewing puzzle. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about that and, uh, you know, how, you know, for a brewery now, you know, Pint House Pizza, your, your volume, you know, per year is about how many barrels this year? Uh, between our two current pubs, we'll do 4,800, a little over 4,800 barrels this year. And uh, we'll have our third one online before the end of the year. So, you know, we might do 6,000 combined barrels this year, with, you know, probably 10 to 12 next year. So not tiny, but still no, pretty small I mean, in the world. Yeah, of pretty small overall. Yeah. You know, um, you know, and yet that selection process with hops is something that you've been uh, a you know, diehard uh, proponent of since you started the brewery. You came out of uh, you know working at a larger scale brewery where that kind of hop selection process was integral um, and, and routine at Odell Brewing. Um, what'd you pick up and what'd you learn from uh, from doing your time at Odell about uh, how to select hops and uh, what to look for and go through that process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, first and foremost, Beer is an agricultural product, and you know anybody who talks to me about hops long enough uh, will probably hear me rant about how I get frustrated. You know, when when people don't understand, you know, how much work the farmer puts into these hops, and how important it is to you know treat them with respect and and uh, go out and select and support your farmer and and know what you're getting. And so we you know we spend a lot of time out there for how big we are, and um, it, it was really instilled in me while I was at Odell. Uh, by Brendan McGivney, who, you know, put so much emphasis on on getting out there and spending time with the farmers and, you know, communicating to the farmers what what we're looking for in our hops so that they can grow and get better. You know, um, you talk about a feed, feedback loop in, in craft beer and, and knowing what the consumers want in the beer you're producing. Well, we have to provide that loop for the farmers so they know what to be planting in the fields how to be harvesting and drying and what flavor and aroma qualities we're looking for in our beers. So, you know, we, we try to spend time talking to them, you know, I have a great relationship with a number of farmers out there. And at this point it's like kind of, it's going and seeing friends, which is, which is always cool. And, uh, you get to see people who are so passionate about their craft and it just happens to be growing hops. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like a kid in a candy shop for a week, getting to smell all these, you know, wonderful citron, Simcoe and mosaic fresh off the, off the kiln or, you know, fresh in the bale. Now, one of the things you mentioned to me when we talked before is uh, you have, you know, in order to um, be able to use and, and uh, order the volume of hops and therefore be able to select and, and interact with uh, growers on these certain varieties, you have enforced, even in your own beer design, uh, an economy in hops usage, you know, where some brewers will use the, you know, the whole spectrum of hops mm-hmm. and uh, try small amounts of everything. 
you've been very disciplined in trying to focus on a few uh, some core varieties uh, almost like a painter using a limited color palette uh, so that you can use the absolute best pigments that you can and uh, how, do, how do you then focus on what those hops are going to be how many hops you're going to you know, keep in your arsenal and how do you design you know that kind of breadth of creative beers using a kind of limited number of hops in the brew house yeah, we focus, I mean, we have a limited number, but it's still a number of, you know, different varieties. Um, you know, we're not just like, say, the big three, Citrus and Co Mosaic, by any means. But we do, you know, I would say those are kind of our three foundational hops. Yeah. And and then uh, we do use a lot of varieties like Azaka, um, Denali, uh, Amarillo, and, you know, amongst others, Laurel, Equinot. And... The reason yeah, we choose to keep it a little more limited at our size is that allows us to go out and select the specific lots that we want to get the flavor profile we want. And you know, I've never found it limiting because at the end of the day, you know, you there's so many ways you can introduce the hop into the beer and get a different character out of the same hop. Um, so, you know, we'll take Citra, for example, if, depending on where you add that in the Whirlpool dry hop. If you're adding it early in the dry hop while there's active fermentation or you're adding it later while there's less fermentation happening, you can get a much different you know, biotransformation effect and a much different character overall. And you start to get... What are, uh, what are some of the differences in those characters? I'm curious. So we find you know, if we're adding citra really early on in our dry hops, we'll get a lot more of... Uh, well, and this depends on what you have for your citra. You know, Hopefully you have a really sure. nice uh, lot of it. But um, you know, we, we might get more of... Uh, some of the mangoes and um, almost some of the more estery um, characters of that because you're getting that um, the yeast interaction. And if you're adding it later, we'll tend to get some, you know, maybe some of the little more pungent, danker notes. And both of them can be great. It depends on what you're looking for in your overall recipe. Sure. And so, you know, it's going back to that, like, just because a hop is called something, you know, a cascade isn't a cascade isn't a cascade. It's what cascade you select. Uh, using one hop can give you a ton of different flavors and you could pour someone a you know 100% citra beer that's done two different ways and it could taste like a completely different hop you know speaking of that now you know that's something that a lot of professional brewers say and it's hard for I think a lot of people to put that into practice that um, you know your recipe is a recipe but you know how often do you get a lot in that doesn't necessarily taste or, or rub or smell exactly how you expected it to and then reconfigure a recipe, you know, for what that hop actually is. That happens all the time. Um, you know, as we've been able to grow, we've been able to select more varieties, and that's one of the the great things that comes with with growth. You know, we when we were doing a thousand barrels a year with just one pub, we really didn't have the opportunity to select very much. Um, it was basically the relationships I had. I was able to, you know, maybe piggyback on someone else's right. uh, contract that. You know, someone like an Odell, they were always really nice to me. If they were a little long, they could they could help me out or um, some other friends in the industry. So, you know, we're trying to be strategic and kind of creative to figure out ways to do that. Um, and so as we've grown, we've been able to take that into our own hands and, and be more selective. And then, you know, when we go out, this is, you know, kind of a good example of coming off of selection, but we go out selecting for the profile we want the beer, you know, to stay we, you know so we take our electric jellyfish ipa for example it's our flagship most of the hops we're selecting are kind of we're looking at that beer because that's what we're trying to maintain but we're not just trying to keep that beer the same we're thinking about like if this lot could influence it in a way that would really drive it into a, a new direction that we'd be excited about we're going to go with it you know so 2018 electric jellyfish might not be the same as 2019 you know i think it's going to be very close but you know it's like I, I always hate to use references to the wine world because I think they get way too much credit for doing this kind of stuff. But, <laughs> you know, they get to put vintages on it and uh, consumers recognize that. But in brewing, I feel like we rarely are able to do that. People don't often look at the nuance of, say, the hop being used or, you know, if we put the farmer on our tap wall that, you know, with one of the hops in our beer, people don't see that the same way. And we're, we're trying to educate people. We're trying to get people to understand. But um, I think we still have a long way to go. So it's little by little and you know beer's consumers, always evolving consumers seem to want that though you know it's, it is some, yeah, some do one. for sure yeah. yeah where uh you know your 2018 version is a new one to check in on untapped and so you get one more one more new beer that way yeah yeah and, and how you do know, you from a consumer or commercial perspective though you know there has to 
I mean, the history of brewing has been one that has been defined by consistency, you know, and we have this mentality of consistency that is driven um, and that philosophy is driven, I mean, realistically by expectations set by, you know, your big three macro brewers because every product they make is perfectly consistent. Well, although I shouldn't say that it's not necessarily consistent. It does. They do change their stuff over time. They don't ever tell anyone that they're doing that. Um, and they have very sophisticated ways of, of going in for and doing that. But the idea is that, you know, they're, they're maintaining this consistency and that all beer should be that kind of consistent. Um, you know, from, from your customers at, Pint House Pizza, um, how do they take to the idea that this electric jellyfish might be a little bit different than the last one? That's a good question. I, I think a lot of people, you know, I always joke that no one complains when a beer gets better. Yeah. You know, they always seem to, if a beer isn't as good, then they seem to let you know right away. Um, but I think we've, partly we've been fortunate because from day one, we've always put our batch numbers you know, alongside the beer at our Burnett Road location, uh, Lamar, the Lamar location, we, we don't have that capability on the tap wall. But, you know, I think people know that we're that we're very we're always tinkering. We're trying to be innovative. And you know, I was just having a conversation actually with another brewer out in Yakima about I think there's about the shift that I think is kind of happening in the industry where we're moving away from, you know, beer just being a manufacturing product and you know, we often as small brewers, you know, we go to the craft brewers conference or we're reading technical articles and a lot of the stuff that we're, you know, still being taught, so to speak, is it's really around manufacturing. And what we're doing isn't necessarily manufacturing anymore. We're, you know, much more in line with a restaurant. You know, we're making stuff that is selling in a few days sometimes or even shorter, a few hours. And uh, we have that ability to tell a customer that we're doing something new brew what we want and you know try all these new techniques because we don't have that manufacturing expectation so i think that the whole model is being shifted you know with more brew pubs and more taproom breweries and uh that's an interesting point to think of your beer menu more like you know what is a restaurant menu with our daily specials and this this hop is the catch of the day where yeah. we managed to grab a great lot of it and we want to share that experience with you even if it's going to be a little different than how this dish might taste uh, you know or this beer might taste in some other context um you know but i hadn't actually thought of using that metaphor it's a, it's an interesting one, way to kind of recalibrate and think about brewing beer given that all of your beer is generally sold actually all of it's sold through draft uh or yeah. packaged into crowlers from your draft lines yeah, we're a hundred percent draft, um, and then we do you know crawler to order, and we're our draft distribution is just in the Austin area. And, yeah, you know most of our our volume is over our pub, so we control the message really well. And what we do send to the market is you know primarily like our electric jellyfish. So it's um, you know we don't we're not necessarily always trying to like tell people about every new beer out in market that we're coming out with, sure, which can be, sure. which can be really challenging. You can overwhelm people with too much information that way. And Absolutely. Uh, people will tune out and just stop paying attention. But yeah. And unfortunately, Austin, you know, we have a extremely captive audience down there. We have people that, uh, I mean, just the overall demographic of, of Austinites is seem to be you know, pretty well educated, pretty into their food, their drink, right, and they want to learn more. They want to be more involved in it, and uh, so that's you know that's really fortunate for us because right. um, you know you could be in a market where really they don't care. They just want to know what the price point is, and um, so we, so we we're lo- we're lucky to be there for sure. Yeah, how has electric jellyfish uh, you know transitioned since since you started brewing it? I mean, it's, a, it's been a few years now, right? Yeah, um, it's, you know it what has. are what are these? Pr- I know, right? Uh, hazy IPA is it that old it's already? Three years. I mean, I can't believe they're still on, so popular. <laughs> um, you know, you know, as you're as you're evolving a recipe, you know, how how large are the steps that you take? How significant are they at each of those individual steps? But if you look back over that three year period of brewing this beer, um, how much? Di- how, you know, how significantly different is it from where you started? And what were those changes? Yeah, that beer in particular hasn't changed a whole lot. We've we've kind of uh, streamlined it a little bit from a production standpoint. Um, you know, when we wrote the recipe initially, it was a one-off five-barrel recipe at our Burnet Pub, and you know, before we opened our second location. And so, when we scaled it up to you know a full um, seven and a half-barrel knockout for our fifteen-barrel uh, tanks, 
you know, the hop increments weren't quite right. And so, you know, we made some, made some adjustments to make it work well on our system at that size. And as you know, hops Hop have changed. increments so that you could do it in, you know, what, 11 pound bags. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, um, it's, it's kind of funny. You talk to most brewers and it's, it's funny how the dry hops always are in about the same amount of, of pounds. Cause we get <laughs> hops in either 11, 22 or 44 pound yeah, packages. Yeah. And I mean, once you open them up, you should use them. So, uh, you know, you, you get away from like when you're a home brewer, you're using like, oh, I'm going to use an ounce here and then a half ounce here. And then you get to a production setup and you're like, I'm going to use all 11 pounds right here. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we brew that beer. We do two batches at that, at that location. We run like a mini production facility. It's, we brew six days a week, twice a day. And, um, you know, having it just easier for our brewers that, that helps us be more consistent too. Cause they're not having to weigh out random increments and open a lot of different bags of hops. Um, so the changes we made to that are, are overall pretty subtle. I think what we've done to it is continue to push the dry hop a little bit to keep increasing the aroma. Right. Um, and, uh, we've lowered the bitterness even more from when we first did it. I think, you know, people's palates have continued to shift towards lower and lower bitterness. And, uh, I think we've softened the water. We have really nice water in Austin, but it has a little bit of temporary hardness. And so for us to get that, you know, juicier mouthfeel, um, we have to work with salts a little bit more. Yeah. And so we've, uh, we've been kind of increasing the, the wetness of the water, which is weird to say, but, <laughs> um, you know, to give that a softer yeah. mouthfeel as people's palates have kind of adjusted to it. Um, but what's funny is we had beers, you know, that are at where this beer is now released three years ago and they were complete duds cause you know, people wanted a little bit more bitterness at that point, you right. know? So it's kind of you know, you get lucky, you catch people's palate at the right spot and then you can kind of bring them with you. And, uh, I think that beer, we've you know been super fortunate to be able to keep riding that wave with it, you know, saying where we think we're very culturally relevant, making really small tweaks now. And then we have other beers that, I mean, they, it's like, you look at the recipe, the brew log, and it's almost a different beer, you know, from one to another, but they might be more one-offs or ones that we're not, you know, looking for as much consistency. Um, you know, as you make these shifts, like, you know, are you, how subtle are you with each one of these shifts? So a beer like that, we'll, um, we'll actually often brew, we brew that one so much that we can, um, easily blend two batches if, if there's too much variation and that, you know, comes back from my training in a production facility, you know, um, there's a, there's a lot of blending that goes on and, and, you know, if you have a beer, that, so you know, for some background, when, when we were at your brewery in Austin uh, earlier this year, you've got a seven and a half barrel brew house. You you know, knock out into fifteen you know barrel tanks, so everything is double brewed, and that gives you that opportunity to, on your second brew, going into that tank, make some adjustments however you want, and then you can even blend from there between your tanks. Yeah, it, well, you know, when we transfer it into the serving tank, we might take two batches and just um, you know, because we brewed that beer in particular so often that. We usually have a batch basically being ready every other day. Hmm. So if we want to just take, you know, half of two batches, we could, you know, if we, if we try to make some changes, we don't really think if it's the flavor profile, like we hoped, we can maybe blend that back with one of our normal batches and hmm. it'll, you know, be in our flavor yeah. matching profile. And, uh, and then we can kind of re rewind and say, okay, let's go a different direction. Um, a good example of that is actually we, um, we started playing around with the dry hop combination uh, just based on some hops that we were getting, I wasn't happy with as happy with one variety, and I was really happy with another one. So we started doing some tests, and uh, we you know we made some subtle changes to the dry hop in that in that case. But while we were doing that, it took three batches to really figure out how much of a shift we needed to make without making it feel like it was different. You know, uh, we just wanted to make it feel like it popped more and was better. And um, you know, I, I liken it to. Um, you know, when you're trying to trying to get really good at something, whether it's sports or anything, you know, you to get within the the last ten percent of of you know being at the top, you can most people can kind of get there really fast, and then you start to get into that last percent, and that's what takes a lot of time and work, and you can go backwards really easy. And um, so we find ourselves, you know, I don't know if we're in the last one percent, but we're <laughs> we're in these points where we're making these small tweaks, and uh, these small tweaks start to feel like they're making bigger improvements than some of the big tweaks we made earlier on. Um, a lot of, a lot of breweries, uh, 
try to go the other direction. They look at the efficiency in the brew house and, you know, want to brew fewer batches and uh, have their staff spend less time on it uh, rather than double batching every single day off of a smaller brew house. You know, you, you mentioned that you came out of a production brew house and a brewery the size of Odell is always going to, you know, do multiple brews per day into a single tank. Um, you know, you've, you're pretty adamant about that, even with the small size of your own brew house, even as you now are producing, you know, almost 5,000 barrels or, or more now per year. Um, you know, it's an interesting strategy and it's one that kind of counters the conventional logic around brew house size relative to overall volume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like when we talked earlier uh, about that, when you're in a production facility, it comes down to, you know, you can, you can look at blending as being one of the most advantageous, ad, advantageous things. You can also look at if you have a lot of tanks going, um, you have more yeast available, um, your beer is going to be fresher. So we're, you know, we're not, we're selling smaller batches or we're brewing smaller batches and selling over the pub. So our beer is never more than, you know, one to three or four weeks old, you know, um, where if we were doing 60 barrel batches and trying to sell it all over the bar, you know, it would take us a while and the beer's not going to be as fresh at the end. And so it's definitely more work. It's more labor, but I, I, I enjoy it because I like the freshness and it's also, it's cool because we've been able to build, you know, an incredible team right. that we're giving more people opportunities to be brewers. More people can learn. They can learn more because, you know, if you're on a system, if you're a small brewery and you're brewing once or twice a week, that's hard to train someone where I can have someone brewing six times a week and come up to speed pretty quickly. So we've been how able often, to, uh, how often do your guys have to, you know, if they're, you know, double batching a single day, make adjustments to the, the second batch, uh, to account for what happened on the first one. Uh, very, very little. It's it, okay. you know, most of our standard beers. We're, we're pretty dialed on unless it's, you know, maybe something fluky happened or we had you know some kind of issue in, in the pub that might've caused say our hot water to not be at the right time. So we're trying to make some adjustments like a mash temperature, but yeah, our, our guys are, they're pretty dialed there. Uh, I look at their brew logs and I mean, it feels like an automated brew house sometimes that they're running. <laughs> it's, it's great. Um, and they're, you know, it comes from a passion and dedication yeah. to it. Still you empower them to, to make some significant decisions about, you know, the beers as they're brewing them. Um, and that requires a significant amount of training. Like you, you mentioned to, to get them to a point where they feel confident to make some of those changes on the fly. Um, you know, how do you manage that with a you know, small brewery with a small staff? Yeah, we, we really want to empower our employees. I, I'm a huge proponent of, you know, bottom up management style. I want them to the people that are closest to the problem to be the ones that are coming up with the solutions. And, um, for, you know, for me, it's, we have kind of, it comes down to if there's, if there's a big thing that needs to change, we'll talk through it as a group and, and try to do that. Otherwise, you know, a lot of the stuff we've talked through one time before they've been trained on. And so, you know, if it's something simple, like making an adjustment on a second batch, they can code, you know, as long as everything's recorded, data's recorded and we have all that to look back on, they can, they can run with it. Um, but you know, if we're, if we're making a change to a recipe, I mean, that's all something that goes through myself and, and our head brewer. And, you know, we always round table everything. We have a very uh, collective approach to recipe writing. So, you know, they're, they're, they're very empowered. And then we, I, I like to kind of think of it as like, I'm putting the bumpers on the, on the bowling lane to make sure we don't get too out of hand, you know? Sure. Sure. <laughs> Let's uh, let's rewind a little bit and talk a, a back a, you know about that hops process. Um, you know, we, we started talking about beer design here, but you mentioned working with growers and trying to tell them what you guys are looking for in those hops. Um, explain you know, like you know how you articulate that to a grower, what it is that you're looking in, in a hop, and how some of the way that they grow and treat those hops can impact some of those end flavors that you get when you open up, uh, you know, that 11 pound or 22 or 44 pound bag at the brew house, uh, uh, months or a year later. I'm not a farmer. They're, they're much better at it than what, you know, <laughs> than I would ever be. So, right. so really it's, it's, it's explaining to them, it's trying to come up with a common language. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to grow a hop to make it smell or taste a certain way, but I know if I can explain to them what I'm looking for and, give them my beer and say, this is what I'm looking for. Or, 
you know, rub hops with them and say, I like this one more than this one. And here's why then they can go back and look at their process and start to see, you know, well, this was dried at a certain temperature or this was from a different pick date. And so they can start to see, you know, what I'm looking for based on having that common language. You know, I'm not I'm never going to go and tell them like, hey, you need to always pick it on this day because they, sure, they, they know sure. how to farm. We just yeah, know how to yeah, brew. Yeah. But but and those that's things why are going to change every year, too. Yeah. Right? And, and that's why it's important, I think, to to always kind of keep in that constant communication and and uh, provide as much feedback. You know, when we select we even the lots that we don't select, we give feedback and we say, you know, we try to grade them and try to say what was you know, what was good, what was bad, you know, maybe why we didn't pick it. Like there was, there was some lots of mosaic this year. Mosaic was just gorgeous this year. I think the best year I've, I've smelled it out there. And there were some lots that were beautiful. I didn't select it. And I, you know, but I'm like, this is an amazing lot. Like I didn't not select it, but it didn't fit our flavor profile. You know, like we're looking right. for a certain type of mosaic and, and actually mosaic's kind of an interesting example this year. We actually selected three different lots so um, we use a lot of T90 pellet and we use a lot of uh, cryo hop. And so I actually had one of them done in cryo because of how I use cryo in my beer. Hmm. And I wanted that character in the cryo. And then the other two lots I had put in T90 blended so that uh, I could get that character in the T90 because of where I use it. So that was the first time I've ever done that. And uh, it just, I mean, it was, there's so many good lots. And I'm like, I kind of want both of them. And it seemed like a good solution. <laughs> well, what was the difference in character, if you can articulate it in some way? So the, the T90 was uh, what I really look for in our mosaic, which is a lot of like blueberry, cantaloupe, almost a little bit of like kind of minty menthol, uh, very fruit forward, yeah. a little bit less sweaty. And the other lot was just, it just had this huge punch, lots of intensity, lots of punch, and, um, still had some nice blueberry notes. But you know, much more dank. And when you go into that cryo format, you get rid of the, all the green matter, so it actually kind of cleans up the hop as well. Hmm. So I figured it's going to have a little more dankness. And once we get rid of that vegetal matter, it should actually kind of show a little bit closer to the other ones. But that intensity is going to be really high. And so I thought yeah. that would be a really great addition because we uh, we always use our cryo hops in the dry hop. So we're looking right. for that that huge punch. I'll circle back to that in a little bit um, because I'm really curious about some of your dry hopping process using cryo hops. But uh, are there any, you know, let's let's keep on the subject of hops trends. Uh, you know, what else, you know, in other hops, Citra, Simcoe, others, uh, what, what other flavor trends are you noticing from this year's harvest that you were selecting? Overall, I thought the, the hops were all, um, you know, average to above average yeah. in the quality, flavor, and aroma that I saw. We felt like um, at least you know what we were able to select in Citra and Simcoe was as good as last year. Uh, we were really happy with them. Uh, we always look for a lot of like very sweet mango in our Citra. We we tend to we probably select a little outside of what would be the main window. Um, we err on the a little bit more like the fruity, more nuanced side instead of that big like punchy in the face Citra, which I think is also beautiful. It's just not where our beers tend to fall. And then um, Simcoe seemed extremely consistent this year. Is really happy with the quality across the board. Uh, the big, the big one that just blew me away this year was Laurel. Was really impressed with the the Laurel that we had put in front of us. And um, yeah, I, <laughs> we use it in our Pilsner. Uh, we have a and that's a French hop, right? It's an American grown hop. Oh, okay, it was new last year. Really cool hop. It's got some American characteristics with some noble underpinnings. And yeah, we use it in our Pilsner, which is a pretty aggressively hopped Pilsner. And I can't wait to get this year's crop in because it has this, this incredible nuance and lots of, lots of like bright lemon, lots of, um, almost berry. Hmm. So it's, it's going to be a neat one, but those, those Laurel was, was just gorgeous across the board from what we got to smell. Anything else that stood out to you? Uh, Zaka was really nice again this year. That's one that we rely on pretty heavily. And uh, um, Amarillo was, um, believe it or not, a little bit of a mixed bag, as it mm. so often is. Yeah. Um, but there was some there was some nice stuff out there, and uh, yeah, I think I think the the stars this year, and from talking to some other brewers, it seemed like Mosaic was one that was kind of consistently blowing people away. Mm. So it was a really good year for Mosaic. From it's what from what it looks like, they they were still picking some of the final mosaics when yeah. we were leaving. 
Um, but at least, you know, I think what's come out of the ground is, is all really nice. It's an interesting question for a consumer, you know, because people develop ideas of what these hops are based on, you know, previous beers that they've had. And so if you had a beer last year, um, you may not even know what crop year that mosaic came from or whether it was a good mosaic or whether it was a great mosaic or, uh, um, you know, but, but still you have these preconceptions about what mosaic is. Uh, you know, it's an interesting point that you make that as, you know, as soon as that brewer switches over to a new crop of mosaic, it could be basically an entirely new beer. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's something that we, we do a lot of blending in our beers. I mean, electric jellyfish, we have like seven different varieties in there. Uh, most of our IPAs, we have at least four or five, which allows us to, you know, cut some of those harsher um, changes off, you know. So when, when we are going into a new crop year, it doesn't feel like, oh, we just pulled the rug out from under someone. Um, but that was something, again, you know, that was, Brendan taught me that early on. Don't, yeah. don't, get, don't totally uh, get in bed with just one hop because if it completely changes, then, you know, you can be in a lot of trouble. Do you do that every time you switch a hop year on a on a recipe? Is you know just you know rub it and uh, make sure that you don't need to uh, fix your recipe numbers around that. We'll usually start brewing some. We'll start bringing in some of the new crop year before we need to make the full switch and doing batches alongside the current ones. That way, same it, beer, or do you brew a different beer or something that allows you to kind of delve into the direct character of that one hop? Well, you know, for, for something that we brew consistently, we'll do the same beer just to make sure there's yeah. not going to be any dramatic changes. Um, and then usually I, we're all such hop nerds at, at Pine House that as soon as we start getting the new lots in, I mean, we're trying to brew the most obnoxiously <laughs> hoppy beers with, you know, the lot that we're yeah. most excited about. And um, so we start to, you start to see more single or maybe, you know, two hop combinations, stuff that, you know, total one-offs, but like really exciting for us because we get to like showcase you know, this hop that, you know, when we smelled it at selection, we're just like, that's amazing. We need to, you know, we need that. And you know, so then all of a sudden we're doing this double IPA that's 15 pounds per barrel of hundred percent mosaic, you know, it's <laughs> super fun. A uh, little nuts. Do you develop those recipes or does your brew house staff do it with you? Yeah. So as we've, as we've kind of grown and, um, you know, more of the guys have, uh, you know, learned more and, and grown experience in the industry, it's become a lot more collaborative. Uh, I, we try to every every you know big recipe that we do, we try to sit down, um, either myself and the head brewer of that pub, or a couple of us, and we'll we'll go through it. Just um, I kind of sanity check everyone before it gets brewed, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, our, our brewer, our head brewer Trevor Kelly and Jacob Passy and uh, Tom Fisher, they you know they're doing a lot of our recipe development right now, and um, and then we got uh, brewer Rafael Aswago who's doing a lot of our Belgian stuff, really driving that. And, uh, you know, those guys are, they're writing great recipes. And so a lot of it's just me kind of coming in at the end and like, all right, let's just make sure this is going to fit the pint house profile that we want it to be. And, you know, let's make sure it makes sense from our hop inventory. Um, just kind of give it that last sanity check and, right. and look at some stuff that, you know, I may have tried three years ago <laughs> and said like, Hey, this didn't work. Let's, you know, maybe try something over here. Um, so it, it's, it's super collaborative and those guys are, are doing a lot more of the, um, you know, initial kind of roughing in the recipes, which is really fun to see. I thought it was interesting when we talked before, you mentioned that you're, you're hiring brew house staff, uh, you know, both you have some staff that have commercial experience, but you also have some staff that uh, have, have no commercial brewing experience outside of working for you. Uh, and that that cultural fit is actually as important, if not more important than that kind of brewing history. Tell me a little bit about that. For sure. Yeah. My, my, uh, we jokingly call him the assistant to the director of brewing now, uh, Jacob Passy. He's been with me from day one. Um, he was our, you know, he, he took over as head brewer at the Burnett Pub when we started building Lamar, and then took over the Lamar Pub as head brewer. Now he's going to be kind of our regional head brewer. Help help me uh, oversee all three locations. And he started as a bartender with us. Um, never brewed commercially. Never even home brewed. Um, so he's you know come from just loves beer, loves making beer works hard and, you know, kind of trained him from, from the beginning. And we actually did this really cool thing with uh, our friends at Breakside Brewing a couple of years back where uh, we sent Jacob up there for two weeks and we took one of their brewers for two weeks. Oh, nice. We did a little brewery exchange and, and uh, you know, the part was they were working on building a new pub. Um, and so we thought, well, we can give one of their brewers a little more true, you know, pub experience at the size we were because at the time they had the really small location and then 
uh, you know, their production facility. And then, you know, Jacob could go up there and learn a little bit more about production, you know, brewing and, and kind of see a different system since he had only ever worked at Pine House. And uh, so that was you know, super productive and a really fun thing to do. And then, uh, yeah, it's funny, funny things happen sometimes. And uh, we just actually um, had Tom Fisher, who we, we did the swap with, with Breakside. He just happened to be moving to Austin with his wife and uh, hit me up and asked for a job. And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you've already worked for us, so it's hey. a no-brainer. So, um, yeah, ben, ben might not be as happy with me about that, but it worked oh, out really well for us. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's, let's go back and talk a little bit about dry hop. you mentioned cryo hops, you know, uh, brewers that I've talked to, there's a lot of mixed opinions out there. Um, you know, certainly issues on how you use them to get maximum effect. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you use them and how you overcome some of the challenges of, you know, getting that hop material to circulate within a tank, uh, you know, and fully intermix and have the, the effect of, of cryo hops. And then what you found about when you add them and what kind of effects you get that way. For sure, we've we've done a lot of different things at this point. We were, you know, we actually YCH was having us do some of the early tests with with trying to figure out how to use it effectively in beer, and uh, that was before it was pelletized. It was just a big bag of cryo, which right. was like it was really cool, but it was terrible to work with. <laughs> you you know, it's super messy and. Um, just wasn't fun. So the pelletized form is a lot easier and, and it actually goes into solution a lot better. And so a lot of the practices now are just following what we did with T90 Standard pellet practice. And we've kind of found that, you know, for the most part, uh, we're really happy with like a 50%, um, cryo 50% T90 in a lot of our dry hops. And what happens when you go out of that kind of ratio either way? Well, it depends on the recipe. So we, we do have a beer that we, that's probably our second most popular beer called training binds and that's hundred percent cryo dry hop, but we designed the beer around that. And so I think that that, since we took that into account, it works. But when we've tried to take, you know, another beer that was designed around a full T90 dry hop and switch it, it seemed to make a big difference and not in a good way. Hmm. Um, Cause you're almost relying on maybe some of that polyphenol character that you get off of the pellet, the T90 pellet. And so you realize like you needed that, you needed that little bit of an edge or something. Um, it's not vegetal enough for you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, you know, like, cause you think about like a perceived bitterness or an astringency and, um, you got to think about the whole way that the beer drinks, yeah. you know, it's not just IBUs. It's, sure. Sure. You know, um, we, we don't even, we don't measure IBUs, you know, we go off of what works for our palates and we yeah. kind of have just this overall system that all of our IPAs kind of follow, you know, and we've had them analyzed and they fall about where we would think, but, you know, if we, we could also brew some beers at, in like target, you know, 50 IBUs and it might taste really low, might taste really high, you know, it depends on the overall recipe. So with cryo, it's kind of thinking about how that's going to interact. And then what we've also found with cryo is it really allows us to just add it in more places. Cause, hmm. um, you know, we do so many hoppy beers to get our yeast is sometimes to get our yeast and repitch is sometimes a challenge. And so what cryo has allowed us to do is, is do mo- more multiple dry hops maybe before we're harvesting because it doesn't have that green matter. It's not mixing in with the yeast and we're still, still able to get a really good harvest and, you know, be reusing our yeast in much hoppier beers. Oh, that's an interesting point that I haven't heard before. Yeah, it works out. It works out really well. And we've, uh, we've had some of well, our friends at Austin Beer Works have, uh, they ran some samples for us. You know, I was kind of curious from a micro level and, you know, they all went through and, um, we've had a couple other uh, larger breweries that we've done collabs with do some of the same techniques, and they've passed their lab. So I feel pretty pretty confident that it's a it's a fine practice. So cryo is letting you dry hop during active fermentation, but still get a large enough uh, yeast harvest off that. Hmm, that's a cool. And idea. then we can we can dry hop more during active fermentation. I mean, we you know a lot of our beers are dry hop two or three times. Uh, yeah, because we're just trying to get different complexities in there. So now with cryo. You know, we've been able to take some beers that were only a single dry hop before and build more complexity into that beer by adding a second or sometimes a third yeah. dry hop. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your hot side stuff. Are you, how do you, you know, target that bitterness? Are you adding initial bittering charges? Are you all, uh, you know, late hops now? Um, what's your whirlpool process look like? And, um, you know, are there specific temperature goals around that where you find you get, get what you want out of those hops? We, we do a lot on the hot side. Well, it depends on the beer. You know, if we're doing a more 
traditional, maybe West Coast inspired IPA will do more traditional uh, bittering charge. Yeah. But we've definitely found that we, we do do a fair bit on the hot side, um, more so than, you know, I think some breweries that maybe just adding it in the Whirlpool are just doing massive dry hops. And um, we feel like it just still gives it like a little bit more backbone, makes mm-hmm. it a little more stable. Uh, we get a little bit more complexity. Um, they're very restrained editions. You know, we're not yeah. trying to like target 75 IBUs on like a 60 sure. minute edition or something, but uh, we do a lot of first word hopping. That's a, it's a definitely a mm-hmm. practice that we're a huge believer in. We should do a lot of mash hopping. Um, but then most of our editions past that, uh, you know, a lot of our newer IPAs, you know, are down at just Whirlpool. And I think like a lot of brewers now, we're, we're a huge proponent of the low temp Whirlpool. And we've actually done a lot of tests. Low where, temp whirlpool. What, what do you what do you call a whirl? Uh, what temperature is your low temp? <laughs> well, whirlpool? we we still keep it over one eighty five. Okay. Uh, mainly for stability, micro sure. stability. Um, you know, I know home brewers that are taking it. They're doing like crazy ones down in sure. like the one twenties sure. and all this stuff. And and it's you know honestly, you're putting that many hops in there. It's probably going to be stable, and you're not going to have to worry about it. But right. um, we do a lot, you know, in that one eighty five to two hundred range, and we've um, we've had them tested. Yeah. Um, for IBUs and you know we definitely see a, a pretty big uh, shift and so we can get we can <laughs> this is like you know one of those things they don't teach in brewing school so we can we figured out a way to put more hops and get less bitterness <laughs> and uh, and so that was really exciting yeah, for us yeah. you know not, not every brewer is like looking for that but sure. you tell that to the German brewers and they look at you funny but um, so we've been able to like sometimes up our, our where whirlpool. The flavor is though. Yeah, yeah. So you know we're adding sometimes like a pound more per barrel in our whirlpool and not increasing bitterness, which is or a pound per barrel more. You know, so it's it's allowing us to just drive more aroma, more flavor. Um, so that's that's been huge. I think about three years ago we started really playing with the low temp stuff and yeah. Um, that's I think the thing that we've found in the last year and a half that we're, we're starting to see the biggest gains from. Uh, how much bitter bitterness are you generally pulling out of your dry hopping? I mean, I know conventionally they'd say none, but I mean, obviously we all know that these days that uh, your dry hopping is, is certainly adding some bitterness to your beer. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't, uh, I haven't had any samples done where we've like taken any pre and post we've talked about it and it's just not something that we've gotten around to doing. Um, I know there's been some studies too that say like if you dry hop, heavily, you know, after, um, you actually start to see bitterness go down. So I, you know, it's tough to tell. I think that, I think it goes back to that polyphenol thing too. I think cryo helps with cutting some of that polyphenol hmm. astringency out of it. So you can get bigger dry hops yeah, and not get that, but then too much cryo. Sometimes you can get what people kind of like into like a hop burn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, I never want to fall into a camp where we're making a beer that people want five ounces of. You know, I want people to drink. Sure. They want to come in and drink three pints of it, you know. Doug O'Dell always told me, he's like, you don't, you'll never be a success, successful business if people just want to drink a taster. You know, you need to get them to buy a six-pack. And, uh, you know, so it comes down to you, you want to put all this hot flavor and aroma in there, but you also want someone to want to drink three of them, you know. And so that comes down to, like, how do you balance all that together and have like have something that's just mind blowingly, you know, aromatic and flavorful, and then drinks really nice. And that's the challenge, you know. Like you can just keep dumping hops into it, you just don't want to drink very much of it. And you can make it smell good, but it doesn't drink well. You know, a, a number of brewers that I've talked to are, you know, have settled into longer conditioning times. In fact, uh, uh, Henry of Monkish and I were talking about that on his uh, edition of the podcast a few months ago. Uh, that we recorded in Austin, where you are, um, you know, and he mentioned, you know, 32 day, you know, lo- longer, uh, you know, conditioning processes for these beers in order to drive that burn down, you know, you with a pretty small pub system and having to, you know, fill and turn tanks uh, pretty frequently. I imagine having that long of a production period for some of these you know, hoppy beers might be a little bit of a challenge. How do you, how do you manage some of that uh, burn? And, uh, and producing a beer that, that tastes the way you want because it's so, it has to be drinkable the moment it goes into a serving tank. Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, with our, like our double IPAs and stuff, we'll often hold them for an extra, extra week in our mm. serving tank or sometimes more wow. if it makes sense. 
Um, so that's we, some real discipline right there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's money you're, uh, you're you're losing. Well, yeah, it's but you know you you only get you only get to have someone you know taste your beer for the first time once, and you, you want to blow their minds every time. You know, so if they come in and they drink a beer that's super green, they're probably going to be questioning your other beers. So you want it to be right. You know, like yeah, I, if you think back uh, a number of years ago when barrel aged shouts were taking off and all these brewers are releasing barrel aged shouts that they're telling people to age for two years, and it's like. Well, why not just age them for two years and then sell them to people, you know? <laughs> sure, and I sure. get it. I get, you know, we yeah. all get it from the economic standpoint. It's way better to make the money and get it out of your warehouse. But, uh, you know, especially with IPAs, we're trying to sell it at the peak of freshness so that the consumer gets the best possible beer. We've talked a lot about, I think, when we get our, our Round Rock location going, um, we, we really want to add a few more days to, like, our electric jellyfish. Um because we actually think it tastes often better when we have it out in market and it's, you know, a week old. Right. Then sometimes like the pub will be two days old and it, you know, <laughs> I think it tastes awesome, but it's a little more green, you know, and sure. Um, sure. But I also like that too. You know, it's a little more, as long as it's not too green, you don't want something that feels like it's not done with its process, but it also depends on your yeast. You know, we, um, you know, if you, so I think some of the English yeast clean up differently than some of the Americans, then, you know, some of the other yeasts are used out there. So, uh, our yeast, I think fortunately cleans up pretty quickly and I think it supports the, the aging process a little bit better than, than some other yeast. So I think we're, we're pretty fortunate with that. Do you, do you mention what that yeast is or do you keep that one proprietary? <laughs> uh, we don't, it's, it's kind of unique, so we don't talk about it too much, okay. but, uh, but yeah, it's not what, London three. What, what, fam- <laughs> what family is it in? <laughs> um, it's, it's. Somewhere between an ale and a lager. Oh, interesting. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you know, it's, I find it curious because there are some consumers out there that actually embrace that burn and uh, that want to feel it. And you know, you know, craft beer consumers will never cease to amaze me. They're always those folks that that want to, you know, feel the the toughness from drinking the hardest thing they possibly can with whether it's the most alcohol or the most hops burn. But but yeah, I've I've you know, there are some folks that have. Uh, you know, actually dinged beers out there in the world because they didn't get that kind of burny character. It's almost interesting how the audience can adapt to wherever the industry tends to go with these kinds of things. Well, I remember when I was getting into IPAs, I mean, I remember like just suffering through, you know, these extremely bitter, you know, West Coast inspired double IPAs 15 years ago. And I'm like, I don't even think I like it, but I got to keep drinking them, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think in some ways, like that's, you know, when a style starts to take off, it's kind of follows the trajectory of punk rock music a little bit, you know, it's a little edgier at first and then it starts to get a little more polished until it's a little more radio friendly and the wider audience starts to be more into it. And it's not a bad analogy. (laughs) Um, hop creep, something that I hear a lot of brewers talking about these days. Um, you know, a little bit of extra fermentation happening as you add those dry hops, um, you know, uh, as we all know, hops contain some enzymes that actually can kickstart or restart uh, some fermentation, and that can often produce some diacetyl or some other other uh, you know byproducts. Uh, you guys, you know, obviously dry hop aggressively. What have you found around that, and how do you kind of manage or mitigate some of uh, the issues that come from that? Yeah, I think that's another place where we're we're super fortunate with the yeast strain that we use. It's uh, we really don't experience hop creep, and it's not a diacetyl producer, so we. We don't really have that issue. Um, I, I actually didn't even know about it until I started seeing, <laughs> you know, started like seeing some talks yeah, at CBC yeah. and different stuff pop up. And and actually, a good buddy of mine, um, Will Golden, and at Austin Beer Works, and, and then Josh Hare at Hops and Grain. We we'll get together like monthly and roundtable our beers. And those two started talking about it a little bit, and that's what kind of got me interested in it because we had never really seen it. Um, and then when we started playing around with you know yeast like London Three or some of these you know more I guess. It's bizarre to say this, but more traditional New England IPA <laughs> yeasts that uh, we we would start to experience it. So, um, yeah, I'd say like with what we use for our house yeast, we just don't really have that issue. Um, so I, I can't really speak to it too well, other than I'm really happy that we don't deal with it. <laughs> Fair enough. That's an interesting idea that you get together with, you know, pure brewers within your market. Um, one of the, you know, I, I say this to brewers all the time. One of the interesting, you know, positives and negatives of the craft beer world is that when you work at a brewery, you drink a lot of your own beer. And when you drink a lot of your own beer, uh, that, that effect of drinking your own beer creates and reinforces 
that house flavor and imprint on your own palate. Uh, the way that we sense things is impacted by the things that we sense. Um, you know, there's plenty of science out there that proves that. And so when you eat something in a specific way, it's going to, uh, you know, create a palate for you that your palate does not exist independent of the inputs that you put into it. And so, you know, when a brewery is all drinking their own beer all the time, because most breweries give their, their own employees, their own mm -hmm. beer, that becomes the thing that they drink. And so they start to like and, and set the bar for what they brew based on what they drink. Um, it can be hard for a brewery to get out of that kind of echo chamber and, uh, and sense beer the way that their consumers sense it because you know consumers out there in the market are nowhere near that loyal they are generally drinking a lot of different beer from a lot of different producers and so you know at that point their palates are broader and bigger uh, you know than the brewers that are making that beer but you know for you to create something that resonates with those consumers i mean you you have to also experience things in different kinds of ways and and push yourself you know how, how do you do that in a professional way to to make sure that you're tasting things fresh and not just you know rocking your own house style you know to its own detriment we're really fortunate too because we sell guest beer in our pubs yeah so you know from day one we said we wanted to put the other beers that we're able to get in austin uh that we think are great on the wall next to ours you know and, and you know we wanted to one you know when we were getting going we wanted to prove to people that we're making beer as good as these other brewers that, you know, we think are amazing. And then also we want to be tasting what we think is, you know, some of the best producers are making and making sure that, you know, we're kind of always benchmarking with it. And if we start to see, you know, someone just killing a certain style, like maybe we got to up our game there. And so it's, it's nice having guest beers readily available in the pub. I, I spend a lot of time, you know, just going through the tap wall, tasting, you know, whatever we have on tap from, from different breweries. And then, uh, like I mentioned, Josh and Will and I get together and we taste each other's beers, or sometimes we'll get beers from outside of the market and taste and, um, just kind of, you know, talk about what we're doing, what we're working through, you know, trying to get better and trying to, um, you know, it's really nice because we're three completely different size breweries. And so, you know, sometimes it's like Will can try something on a really large scale and get his feedback a lot quicker than maybe I could on a smaller scale. Or, you know, Josh has um, some really small fermenters that he can split batches off of his brew house on and, you know, do different yeasts and stuff. So it's been a, it's been a really um, cool thing that we've been able to do. Um, we actually... Fortunately, we're all kind of growing really fast right now, so we haven't been able to do it for a few months, but uh, hopefully someday soon again. We'll, but we've been doing it for the last, I think, two and a half years. It's been a lot of fun. It's a nice divide and conquer mentality. That, yeah, uh, and you know, I think all of our beer... together than if you were doing it all apart. Absolutely, and I think our beer has, has all, you know, across the board, has improved um, exponentially as we've been able to do this. And, and I think, you know, to your point, it allows us to get outside of what we're drinking on a daily basis and... And, you know, maybe, maybe our beer isn't as good as we were excited about on this last batch, you know, like we just get so in our head that it's just the most amazing batch ever. And all of a sudden you, you know, put it down next to your friend's most amazing batch ever. And you're like, yeah, I'm not quite where I thought I was. And so it's, you know, it's nice because you get to be humbled and you get to like figure out how to go back and, and get better. Uh, that's, that's certainly a nice process over the, over the history of pint house. How have you watched? I mean, I imagine as you're getting started, you, you sold more guest beer, um, but you're now making a lot more beer than you were back in those days. How has that, uh, that mix, uh, shifted for, for pint house over the years? A lot of it early on was we just couldn't ever brew enough beer. Right. And we've been kind of constantly trying to add tanks or figure out ways to make more beer from day one. So a lot of that's been, I think, what kind of uh, puts a ceiling on how much of our house beer that we sell. But our mix is usually in the 70 to 80 percent pint house beer. And um, the remaining, you know, uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent, we include cider in there because that's on our guest wall. Cider actually makes up a pretty good chunk. Hmm. And then, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of the styles that we don't make is what sells. And, you know, we, we live in Austin where there's Live Oak that makes a world-class hef. I'm not going to go and try to make a half just because I want to put one on the wall. I'm going to buy theirs because it's delicious and put it on the wall, you know? So we'll bring in those styles that, you know, we know they're excellent. We're not going to try to brew them. Let's serve them here. That's a good point. Now, it's interesting because your beer list, last time I was at the Lamar Pub, 
uh, was something like, I mean, 48 or 50 taps and only about 10 or 12 of them were your own beers. And, you know, and so the, even if it's only 20% of your total sales, I mean, it's those guest beers make up a lot of numbers of taps in your pub. Absolutely. We, we try to give people variety, you know, there's the, the kind of going back to that consumer base in Austin, a lot of people want to try what's new and, and, uh, they want to see what else is out there. And, you know, we, we, what I see is a lot of people too, they'll come in and, you know, they might buy, uh, say we get a new beer in from say like a hops and grain or an Austin beer works or, you know, one of the other local breweries or a regional brewery that's new to market. They'll have one of those. And then I feel like they jump back to what they drink from us, you know? So it allows them to kind of come in, try something new, you know, maybe they love it and keep drinking it, but then they, a lot of them will go back to maybe what they like from us or, um, you know, we get a lot of people that come in and do flights, especially, you know, people who are super into hops, get like three of our IPAs and put them up against, you know, the new Luponic from Firestone or the new one from Odell or something like that. You know what, as we wrap up here, uh, you mentioned that coming out of GABF, you're flying right back to Yakima to go do another round of selection. Um, coming, coming out of, uh, hops harvest this year. Uh, what do you find most exciting? What are you most excited to, to share with your customers? Um, and, uh, and maybe it's, maybe it's not even, uh, you know, hops related, but what is it, uh, you know, that's hottest on your horizon right now that, uh, that really gets you excited about brewing and designing beers? I think, I think I'm most excited every time coming out of harvest from some of the conversations I have with, with the brewers up there. And I usually come away with a lot of new ideas or get inspiration for new beers. So next week, before we do selection, we're going up to brew with Cloudburst and then uh, Called Arms. Um, the three of us all meddled in, in Fresh Hop at World Beer Cup last year, so we thought it'd be fun to do a beer together. Um, and just in that exchange and setting up this beer for the collaboration, you know, as we're working on the recipe, I'm getting all these new ideas on like what we could do for our own you know, beers in-house. And uh, we haven't even brewed it yet, so I, I'm super excited <laughs> to go brew that next week. And then um, I got to have a, a great conversation with uh, Neil from Weldworks uh, Monday night. You know, he was out there selecting, and we were talking about what we were selecting. And he's actually coming down to Austin to brew with us in early October, which is super fun. And, you know, having these conversations with these brewers that um, you, you respect and that, you know, you've had their beer. And then to be able to, you know, sit there, you know, smell hops all day, talk with farmers and then talk, you know, often very candidly with other like very creative, very innovative brewers. I always feel like you come out of harvest, just so excited to just get back and like, all right, (laughs) we need to revamp everything and make everything better. And, you know, that's clearly not what we do, but you know, we, it's like, we come back and like, all right, let's, let's try this now. Let's do this. Let's try this new hop that we smell. Like, you know, someone threw on the table for us. It's maybe not uh, ready yet. Like I was walking through the, um, the single hill farm with Jason Peral, who's the, the main hop reader and smelling a couple varieties that we're super stoked on. And, uh, we're going to be getting to play with a little bit more this year. And like, that's super exciting that we got these, you know, experimentals coming to us and we're going to get to make some beers with them. And so it's, you know, I think it's just every year it just reignites my passion for, for innovation and making, you know, new cool beers and, you don't feel stagnant, you know, and every, and then you get to smell the the new hops, and so it's like, okay, now it's now my beers are going to taste a little different. That's exciting, you know. You don't just feel like you're getting into the cycle of like, all right, I'm making beer every day. It's like you're feeling like you're always trying to get better and and you know provide our consumers with something new and exciting. I guess that's the beauty of beer is agriculture. Beer is agriculture, yeah. Well, cheers to that. Joe Moorfeld, Pint House Pizza here on the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. If people want to learn more about Pint House Pizza, where can they find you guys? Uh, you can check us out at uh, pinehousepizza.com. And uh, we got a bunch of social media outlets on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, um, mostly around that whole Pint House Pizza thing. Um, so check us out. And if you're looking for some of the stuff we're doing in market, uh, especially if you're in outer markets when we're doing collabs, uh, Pine House Beer on Instagram is a, is a great source for that. Well, cheers. I'm going to look forward to drinking a few of your beers here at the Great American Beer Festival. Joe, thanks so much. 
Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed the podcast, we hope you hit that subscribe button on whatever platform that you are listening on. We also hope you subscribe to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. And, uh, you know, if you enjoyed this conversation with Joe, you can find a cover story on our Brewing Industry Guide uh, focusing on Pint House Pizza with a full-on case study that Joe was so kind to uh, to share with us. So check that out at brewingindustryguide.com. Subscribe to the magazine at beerandbrewing.com. And we will be back next week with a new episode. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.